you know, brain computer interface signal processing part. Signal processing used in brain computer interface. So as you are already aware of, you know, my style that I always include the pictures and images. What is important here is the focus is more on signal processing, right? There is a brain, the signal is acquired. Remember, signal acquisition or acquiring process is an essential part of signal processing. If the signal requirement or acquisition is not correct, signal processing and the further analysis is badly affected. So signal processing is a single block, but I can tell you there are, you know, a number of operations which take place inside this uh, box. And then uh, after applying the signal processing, we extract the appropriate features and then we can choose suitable number of features. I was telling you feature selection. And then uh, it the features are subjected to the classifiers. We can use any suitable uh, algorithm that can be used to classify those features and remaining thing you know that we have been limiting this. The control interface, it can either provide commands or some feedback signal that goes to, you know, the brain, especially, you know, the mental task or the event related potential. ERP is another terminology which we will discuss later. Probably in the next uh, lecture, we will discuss ERP in detail, right? And, and some mental task may be given. You have already, you know, understood this. So let's begin with the signal processing part. So as you know that we always begin with any lecture of brain signal processing with this structure. Why this is very important? Uh, I was also telling you uh, during that uh, in that PDF, which was highlighting on overview of brain computer interface. So these areas are very important. You can see here parietal lobe, again occipital lobe, temporal lobe and frontal lobe. So if you actually see the the positions of electrodes, which we'll be discussing in detail in the next lecture, you will find that the electrode nomenclatures are related with the names of the different areas like parietal, occipital, and so on. And you also know it very well. Again, do not need to repeat that each lobe has different functionalities. We have already covered. So when we are talking about signal processing involved, Let's begin with the brain activities which are recorded and those brain activities are recorded in terms of signals and then processing is applied. So uh, we were already talking about that there are three important processes which are there in brain inside the brain, uh, namely electrical, chemical, metabolic, and also these are known as electromagnetic activities which results in neurons action potential that itself is the result of chemical events occurring in and around the neuron. Action potentials and other neuronal electrical phenomena, either action potential or electrical phenomena, allow the electrical measurement of brain activities. We can do electrical measurement with the help of EEG and electromagnetic measurement with the help of MEG. MEG is magnetoencephalography, EEG is electroencephalography, electrocarticography. If you have, if you remember in the last lecture, we were, we were talking about ECOG as a semi-invasive method or with microelectrodes implanted in the brain tissue. This is the example of invasive technique. So the microelectrode, the placement, the sensor implantation, we will cover in the next lecture in the design part. So EEG and MEG sensors are located very far from neuron. You know it very well because EEG and MEG sensors are generally deployed on, uh, you know, placed on scalp and the signals acquired with the help of EEG and MEG sensors do not allow precise identification of active brains, but that, that provides a rough you know, approximated electrical phenomena, which is inside the brain. So brain activities can also be detected by measuring number of chemical processes uh, called as PET, that is position emission tomography, which involves, I was telling you in also, also in the last lecture, injection of specially manufactured markers 
and that have poor temporal resolution. It means that poor temporal resolution means there is a comparison probably in the coming slides. It requires a large amount of time and uh, to produce the signal strength. So this diagram was also part of the last lecture. You can see that clearly see that in PET, the blood flow, uh, the difference can be clearly observed in the person who is normal, the person who is in the early stage or in the uh, later stage of the Parkinson's disease. So the increased metabolic activity increases the demand for the basic fuels of metabolism like glucose, sugar level and the oxygen. This change in demand is detected because it is accompanied by increased blood flow of the region. You know that hemoglobin, uh, which is the essential part of the blood, and that is incomplete without the oxygen. So it is always oxygenated. It is always combined with oxygen. So whenever the blood flow, the oxygen level changes, the blood flow is also affected and that becomes abnormal when there is something wrong inside the brain. So the blood flow is in the brain is highly controlled and locally regulated and it acts as a marker for neuronal activity. This is very interesting diagram giving a comparison, you know, uh, of all the modalities look at microarray. We will discuss probably this microarray in the next lecture because it is mostly on hardware side where we will discuss about the design and implementation of BCI. So you see here uh, both the resolutions are included in this diagram horizontal axis, temporal resolution in a millisecond, and y axis is representing a special resolution number of neurons. So the number of neurons, you know, is very less. Look at here between 10 and 100 in microarray. And you can clearly understand you are inserting a microarray chip inside the brain and that too by applying by doing some surgery. So it will cover very lesser number of neurons and therefore spatial resolution is very, uh, you know, good here. And as far as the, the time is concerned, you look at here hardly 10 millisecond, one to 10 millisecond is the temporal resolution. This is the meaning. Look at the other modalities like EEG, MEG and ECOG. All these modalities, their resolutions, you know, the number of neurons which are covered in these modalities is really very high, um, is in millions rather, 100 millions or 10 millions in numbers. And if you go to functional MRI, near infrared spectroscopy, you will find it takes around 100 to 1000 millisecond. So it's increasing actually. And then uh, the, almost the number of neurons are same. Uh, number of neurons is same. It is only very small in case of microarray. If you go to PET, uh, slightly lesser than EEG and MEG as far as the spatial resolution is concerned, but uh, the temporal resolution is very high. It takes a lot of uh, time like, uh, you know, uh, 10K to 100K uh, milliseconds. So it's almost second, uh, you know, if it is 10 to the power 4 millisecond, it is almost 10 second to 100 second time is a large amount of time that is required. And look at this vertical diagram. Uh, the number of neurons is very less in case of microarray. If you are going towards top, uh, you are covering almost the entire brain. So when you do with the help of EEG, or MEG, you cover your entire scalp and that covers billions of neurons, you know, uh, right from hundreds of millions to billions of neurons. So this uh, is very interesting diagram. What is the application? You know, when we talk about different types of BCI, we have seen that dependent, independent, invasive, non-invasive, but uh, the BCI, the application of BCI is also governed by what kind of task you want to perform with the BCI? What are the purposes of using BCI? Accordingly, there would be requirement of spatial resolution as well as uh, temporal resolution. And accordingly, we can choose a particular modality to be used in the BCI. So there are, uh, you know, various chemicals can be imaged with PET, that is position emission tomography using specially manufactured markers which are injected in the PET scheme and temporal detail and spatial detail are very poor. Why they are poor? Because the resolution is very high to the images produced by electrical and metabolic, metabolic methods. It takes tens of minutes to record PET image 
to the brain. You can see here 10 to 100 seconds is required. The imaging of electrical processes generally give excellent temporal resolution. Here it is. That is either in you know 10 millisecond or maximum 100 millisecond. The problem with microarray is surgery is required. We have already covered that surgery is recommended when the person you know is uh, uh, having the uh, uh, what I can say severe uh, difficulty, say you know brain brain paralysis or that kind of thing, where only this option is left. So one is recommended for the surgery to insert a microarray or a, a microchip inside the brain and to record the brain signal and to either provide the feedback signal or rehabilitation scheme. So this is, uh, uh, you know, there are different, uh, since we are talking about signal processing, let us understand the modalities very, very briefly, what modalities bring what type of signal from the brain, like functional transcranial Doppler, FTCD, it measures changes in the blood flow in the major arteries of the brain. Like TCD spectrum can be seen, can be seen at the depth of 50 millimeter. So still uh, something is there inside, some probe is inserted, TCD probe is inserted, and then you can record the signal. This is not very popular. The equipment is mobile and affordable because it can be performed with a small probe held against the side of the head. I'm sorry, it's not uh, penetrated. It is uh, only recorded from outside. So middle cerebral artery is there from where you can get the signal. This is very sensitive. It can only measure the difference between the left and right hemispheres. This is not useful for BCI purpose. Because why do we, uh, why don't we recommend FTCD for BCI? Because BCI requires the data the signal from the entire whole brain. Otherwise, interpretation would, would not be proper and the command or the signal generated by the BCI would not serve the purpose. And therefore, this is not very popular, not even useful for the BCI application. The next one is PET. <laughs> you can see that this is the PET image of normal brain and the other one is the PET image of brain having Parkinson's disease, suffering with the Parkinson's disease. So the, it is called as position emission tomography. It tracks, it records the blood flow. However, it's very slow. You have seen the temporal resolution is very, resolution we say it's not uh, good. It is low means the timing is high. Temporal resolution is good means the time required is very small. It's very bad means time required is very, a lot. So it requires injection of radioactive compounds and then only you can uh, get the signal. It is very less useful for BCI application because uh, in BCI, what is very important is the speed. If there is a lapse of timing, you know, one second, 10 second is huge amount of time. So interpretation of the signal and generating the command will be so much delayed when we use paid kind of signal. But of course, PET is used in the disease and disorder analysis using computer-aided diagnosis. Without using brain-computer interface, we can just look at the PET and then uh, you know see the blood uh, movement and all that. Ease of use are crucial factor. Ease of use is also not there. You have to insert some materials, markers, and the speed is an important issue. So therefore, it's not very popular and not recommended for the BCI. Next one is functional near infrared spectroscopy. We are using this in our lab. We are using functional uh, NIRS and we are also using EEG. So functional near infrared spectroscopy measures blood flow by tracking changes in different forms of hemoglobins. So what is the difference between this and the, the other one where the blood flow is involved? Here it tracks the changes of different forms of hemoglobin. There are different types of hemoglobin and according, uh, you know, depending on this, how blood flow changes, you look at the diagram, you know, which area is sensitive, less sensitive, more sensitive, according to different types of hemoglobin accordingly, the blood flow is recorded. The changes in hemoglobin that accompany brain activities, I already told you, hemoglobin always accompanies brain activities. Hemoglobin is a part of blood, so are called the blood oxygen level dependent response. 
the this is called as bold response what is bold response is nothing but the changes which we track in hemoglobin that accompany the brain activities called as bold response so functional nirs it uses infrared light of a particular wavelength not all wavelength of a particular wavelength that passes through the skull and then comes back it it just goes inside you know the principle of reflection it is strikes there and comes back wherever it is detected so the infrared light which comes back it is recorded as a functional nirs imaging this has a low spatial resolution but good temporal resolution which we have seen in the uh, uh, the resolution highlighting diagram is easy and convenient to use and therefore having probability for bci development applications so functional nirs can still be used uh, of course the most popular uh, in most of the research activities across the globe is eeg but functional nirs can definitely be one of the possible modality in the bci this is uh, one example where you all understand that uh, how does uh, what is the concept of light source what is the concept of light detector so light source emits the light it goes inside and then it detects a particular thing comes back with the help of light detectors we record the signal so this is how your fnirs works the next one is functional mri that is functional magnetic resonance imaging there are a lot of things related to metabolism blood volume then blood flow and then uh, you know when stimulus uh, means brain receives some stimulus uh, maybe either a motory task or sensory task or a language hope you are understanding you can uh, understand some stimulus is received by sensory organ the neural activity uh, is increased and that also uh, it uh, increases cerebral cerebral function base function uh, this is a biological term which we'll understand later and the local magnetic environment more uniform is small increase in local signal and then this affects the blood oxygen level and this is another you know interesting thing that uh, deoxyhemoglobin probably this uh, statement i have already included it measures the bold response what is bold response is already indicated in the previous slide that tracks the hemoglobin you know uh, that accompanies the blood flow uh the brain activity so by tracking the changes in blood flow indicated by relative amounts of different forms of hemoglobin the method is expensive and technically uh, demanding it is most sensitive and has the highest uh, spatial resolution so how what is blood flow response oxygenated blood is pumped the blood with the oxygen oxygen is oxygenated blood is pumped from the heart through arteries to the smallest blood vessels capillaries that pass through all the organs and muscles we are talking about the signal that is associated with blood flow therefore we need to understand this terminologies otherwise these are looking more biological then it releases the oxygen when it once it passes through the organs and muscles it releases the oxygen that supports metabolic processes the oxygen is there with the blood and absorbs the carbon dioxide produced by metabolic process the blood returns to the heart via veins and then circulates through the lungs where it releases carbon dioxide and picks up molecular oxygen so the newly oxygenated blood the newly oxygenated blood returns to the heart and this cycle repeats each cycle takes about 1 minute in the blood transport of oxygen is carried out by the hemoglobin and uh, iron containing complex protein that can uh, you know that binds oxygen so hemoglobin in the blood exists in the two forms actually i what i wanted to tell you uh, is the two different uh, are the two different form one is deoxyhemoglobin also known as deoxy hb and which does not contain uh, bound oxygen uh, the oxygen which are bound and oxo oxyhemoglobin that uh, you know contains bound oxygen so there are two different forms of hemoglobin as blood passes through the lungs each deoxyhemoglobin picks up four oxygen molecules uh, because they don't have uh, bound oxygen molecules thereby becomes oxy and then once it has four oxygen levels what will happen it becomes oxyhemoglobin as you can see 
when the blood passes through organs and muscles this releases the oxygen uh, means oxyhemoglobin releases the oxygen and whenever it releases the oxygen it becomes deoxyhemoglobin so these are the different kind of things which are associated with the blood flow and the blood flow is depending on deoxy or oxyhemoglobin so that is reported in the the modality which is reported in the previous uh, modality so every modality has a different kind of information which is brought from the brain and then equivalent uh, signal processing is applied to acquire the signal and understand the signal so when brain regions metabolic activity increases this was included in that diagram whenever metabolic activity increases oxygen consumption increases obviously you can understand when metabolic activity increases the supply of blood will increase the blood is accompanying the oxygen and therefore oxygen consumption will increase after about a second the neurons begin to absorb now what is the relation between blood and neurons now coming to that important statement after about a second the neurons begin to absorb more oxygen from the oxyhemoglobin in the blood of nearby capillaries so therefore neurons are now associated with the you know blood flow in the oxygen level so the brain activity in the region falls back to its baseline level and there are three properties the three properties also revert back to their original states three properties associated with the 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 hemoglobin uh, uh, response the method uh, that is uh, very relevant to bci is functional near infrared spectroscopy very very relevant then functional magnetic resonance imaging both measure differences in the colors fnirs because this is depending on spectroscopy near infrared spectroscopy so when you get this modality you will get different color maps or magnetic properties of hemoglobin in the two states either oxy or deoxy and uh, the nirs measures change in near infrared absorption i think we have already covered about this and brain activity involves then communication between the neurons so neurons are communicating with each other and they are interacting with uh, responding to different uh, blood flow uh, changes and that communication is responded in different forms of uh, the biomedical signal so when we want to measure the communication between the neuron which is not directly possible each neuron is because connected to uh, thousands of other neurons and therefore you know there is a complexity so how can you communicate between uh, you know that uh, the interaction between one neuron and other neuron and therefore uh, there are changes in communication which are indirectly measured direct measurement is impossible uh, indirectly measured single neuron firing rates are local field potential so this is very important how do we measure what are the metrics by which we measure the uh, the the communication or interaction between the neuron single neuron neuron firing rates when there is a firing of neuron so there will be generation of some potential or local field potential called as lfp we'll study lfp when we talk about a particular uh, bci type probably called as uh, p300 and other bci types we will discuss about this lfps with uh, microarrays or by measuring large scale field potentials large scale field potentials related to uh, electrocorticogram and eeg so there are indirect methods by which we can measure the brain activities between the neurons the direct is very very difficult the changes in communication are also measured using the functional nirs and mri and hemodynamic changes because related with blood are dramatically less pronounced at the sending end and the neuron cell bodies that generate action potentials that travel along the neural fibers to the termi terminals the meaning is it is very less pronounced at the sending end and where do we actually see some effect uh, we see actually the effect uh, at the terminal where through the nerve fibers that potential is coming either near the scalp or uh, near that electrode the hydrodynamic changes and the field potentials measured from cortex originate mainly from the nerve terminals and this is how actually action potential is recorded you know some uh, neuron uh, does firing because uh, it responds to certain action it responds to certain task 
so some particular voltage you know is it it uh, it that response comes which we call as a firing uh, uh, during certain particular time so these are the different states of the neurons where you can find some potential you know high potential some low potential so these things are actually recorded these uh, you know the pattern of the signal is recorded and this is the basis of what we generate as the electrical signal in different modalities popularly the eeg as the important modality like uh, the the xn potential is the main factor why do we get these kind of signals like delta wave theta wave and alpha waves i have already given you brief description about these waves these are your eeg signal means from eeg signal we can extract these different waves delta theta beta alpha and gamma waves we can extract and these are actually raw signal uh, i'm sorry raw signal is eeg signal and from eeg signal we extract the different uh, waves and these waves are again not the you know uh, the final sig final signals which are subjected to the further stages we extract a number of features from here uh, using a different signal processing method and that is uh, subjected to the classifier or other task so this is what i was telling you look at here t7 t8 i have given you one document you know the frontal lobe look at the positions of electrodes and then uh, you know uh, occipital look at the occipital so accordingly you can correlate with whatever you see here a2 and a1 i was talking about ear lobes similarly you know you can uh, uh, you can uh, uh, describe all these uh, different electrode positions in the uh, that uh, you know uh, uh, acquiring system acquisition system and the name nomenclature is based on the uh, one two three four five are based on uh, either left or right and other uh, the letters are based on the the regions so eeg has the ability to monitor human brain activity in the non invasive manner probably in millisecond we have seen the temporal resolution is very less almost in millisecond continuous eeg recording consist how do we get continuous eeg recording you have seen alpha beta gamma oscillations are there and those oscillations are at different frequencies and that also fluctuate over time and provide meaningful information about a person's brain state we have seen in the alpha beta gamma there are different frequencies at which oscillations are produced and that oscillations also fluctuate over time and that provides meaningful information about brain activity what state the person is in brain oscillations such as alpha 8 to 13 hertz it clearly responds to sensor sensory stimulation when there is sensory stimulation to eyes or some other sensory organ that is reflected another thing is i was talking about we will discuss in other uh, bci system this one in detail event related potential it does not necessarily capture all event related information present in the task the only difference the major difference between erp and eeg is erp is actually used related to some task when there is a task suppose we ask a student to do some game or to read some pattern or uh, or you know to pronounce something to listen to a particular voice and that response to that particular task is recorded as event related potential you can uh, you know by its name suggest event related so it is associated with particular event which is very very popularly used in the home uh, in in a smart home and other applications even in healthcare so we'll talk about this in a particular type of bci called as p300 in detail so uh, the the difference between evoked potential phase locked oscillation induced non phase locked signals so there are different terminologies uh, are there uh, while recording the signal like uh, you know evoked potential event event related potential so in pure eeg signal this is very difficult to isolate individual neurocognitive processes so what processes uh, you know what what we get finally is a combined signal and therefore we need some signal processing or the processes so that we can assess and analyze the signal and this is why there is an importance of signal processing 
so that we can extract more precise information related to number one sensory number two cognitive number three motor events so if we are interested in general you know the the information related to sensory cognitive and motor we can go for eeg but when when we want very very specific information related to either of sensory cognitive or motor events then erps are uh, you know generally rec recommended so common way of analyzing event related eeg signal means you know the modality is still eeg event related eeg signal is nothing but we calculate ERP, that is event related potential. So this is done by repeating an event. What do we do? We will ask the subject or a person to do that task again and again, again and again. For example, visual stimulus on a computer screen. We can ask the subject, look a particular character or a letter on the computer screen again and again, and again and again. Or we can ask a subject to watch a particular movie again and again for 10 seconds or one minute, whatever. We can ask him to uh, listen a particular song again and again, and we want to observe what impression it is creating in his or her brain. And, and then we analyze the small portion of EEG activity that is evoked by this event. Uh, the event here is a visual stimulus that is produced in the brain uh, looking at something you know, on the computer screen. So this area is very, very exciting. The ERP response to sensory or cognitive, you understand there are three major tasks related to brain. One, sensory, second is cognitive, third is motory. Motor is related to movements. A sensory is related to, you know, sensing the real-time world with the help of ears, eyes, etc. And similarly, cognitive is related to the memory. So memory, sensory, and motory. And that consists of number of peaks and deflections. You have seen one example of uh, the potential where you could see peaks and deflections which are characterized by latency, morphology, topography. And these uh, are the terminologies called, uh, used in ERP. Uh, they are called as ERP components. For example, latency, morphology, topography. Latency is nothing but the timing, you know, the time delay which is involved and then morphological and topographical uh, impressions are created in the form of potentials called as the components. ERP components are very small in magnitude, uh, right from 1 to 20 microvolt, and inter-individual change or variation is susceptible to various artifacts. I mean, this is therefore very, very important that the change or the variation from one to other component is susceptible to artifact. If you remember, I started today's lecture by opening an uh, overview document on BCI. There are different types of artifacts. So this ERP component is very, very susceptible, you know, and affected by the uh, artifacts. Where are there are different types of artifacts I was trying to tell you in the beginning. So ERP components now coming to the important thing are represented by letter N or letter P. Like if you if you have heard about P300, a popular BCI, so what is that N or P mean? Later N in the ERP component, it represents negative polarity. N for negative polarity means obviously my negative voltage, that's all. P represents positive polarity. And generally N and P will be followed by, by some number. So if that is followed by a number which indicates either the latency, I was telling you latency means how much <laughs> delay, after which you see the 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 you know the the potential so either the latency or the components ordinal position in the waveform you know what is the ordinal position in terms of timing or the latency is that follows either n or p for example first substantial negative peak for example first important negative peak in the waveform that often occurs about 100 millisecond after a stimulus is often referred to as N100. So when we say N100 as an ERP system, it means the first negative peak comes after 100 millisecond after a stimulus. Remember, a stimulus means uh, that excitement, that input that is, that is sensed by the brain. And after there is a delay, that's what called as latency. 
how much is the delay after 100 millisecond we received some negative potential so which is called as n100 and and we sometime also write it as n1 so n100 indicates that the negative peak and its latency is 100 milliseconds so negative peak is coming not positive peak so the voltage is going down there may be some voltage i have already told you this may be 1 to 20 microvolt the the magnitude is very small but the latency is 100 millisecond and what indicates the first negative peak sometimes when we say first negative peak which is often followed by positive peak called as generally p200 or p2 p300 component exhibits a peak of anywhere generally p300 is not very much related with 300 the timing the latency time for p300 is uh, anywhere between 250 millisecond and 700 millisecond and uh, this is very very popularly used you know the erts are caused by processes i was telling you certain tasks with which subject is associated erps are caused like memory the person is watching a television watching a picture trying to reconnect recall trying to pay attention or trying to observe the changes in the mental state and the processing of physical stimulus uh, you know something which is going on and is trying to observe so that stimulus is affecting so all these are reflected by evoked potential and we call it as ERP and there are different terminologies like P300, P200 I have told you the, the reason for the nomenclature justification for the nomenclature so ERPs are used in where are the areas where ERPs are used in neuroscience in cognitive psychology, in uh, psychophysiology research, dementia, for example, dementia, Parkinson's disease, stroke, head injuries, obsessive compulsion disorder, and others have demonstrated abnormalities in ERP components. It means all these difficulties, you know, disorders and disabilities in the brain uh, can be very well studied with the help of ERP because in ERP, the abnormalities can be seen uh, very clearly in these cases of disease. So in the recent past, very recently, P300 is used very popularly. I was telling you to develop a BCI in which the subject, mean a person can communicate which stimulus he is looking at. So this is very useful. You know, this can assist the person who is handicapped. This can assist the person who is uh, having some sort of mental disorder and disability with the help of BCI commands. The person can, you know, control the home appliances in his home and can, you know, uh, can, can lead to real, to some extent, the normal life with the help of BCI commands. So EEG analysis, we are talking about signal. How do we do the analysis? So when we have signal, signal has been acquired say the waves have been extracted the gamma alpha beta whatever so we need definitely some mathematical modeling mathematical analysis or some computing technique so that we can extract the meaningful content from the eeg signal so that is called as eeg analysis where we apply some mathematical uh, you know model what we sometimes call as uh, we can also you know use ml model or some feature extraction methods or any computing technique, you know, uh, to, or to in order to get the information. So there is the role of ML coming. So, uh, you know, it's not always classifier where the AI and ML uh, starts uh, coming into picture. In the feature extraction very well, uh, the, the ML uh, plays a significant role in order to extract the feature. And if you really uh, talk about uh, today's deep learning, that has an ability like CNN, uh, convolution neural network that has ability to extract the features as well as classify. So both the abilities are there in the deep neural network model. But in other ordinary ML models, we can uh, those models can be used to extract the information and then other AI ML method can be used to classify those features. So the EEG analysis, it aims to help the researchers uh, to gain a better understanding and comprehension of the brain and it can also assist physicians in diagnosis and treatment. 
and uh, believe me that uh, the bci and the computer aided diagnosis in the area of brain uh, uh, brain signal are actually helping the physicians who are working in the uh, you know neuro neurological disorders and disability area we have a national mental uh, health institute uh, a very big uh, health institute in uh, you know uh, specific uh, specifically addressing the mental disorders and disabilities in bangalore bangalore where uh, you know hundreds of patients every day they go and you know the treatment uh, is given to them uh, they are using uh, modern equipments all these uh, uh, where they uh, they they study the neurological psychological parameters so the mathematical model is used to fit the sampled eeg signal and the mathematical model can be parametric or non parametric parametric means if the model is uh, working using certain parameters it's parametric otherwise non parametric we are not going into the detail in coming lectures we will definitely discuss the most eeg signals are in either time domain analysis is made in time domain frequency domain time frequency domain uh, uh, and non linear methods are also available like frequency domain so in signal processing those who uh, have uh, knowledge of signal processing they understand very well what is frequency domain in frequency domain generally the signal is converted into fourier transform fourier transform uh, in digital uh, signal processing we call it as d uh, dst uh, dft that is discrete fourier transform and the uh, you know uh, and and fast fourier transform to compute the fourier transform to the uh, of the discrete time signal so what is the advantage of frequency domain analysis uh, if you compare the time domain signal you know uh, it's very difficult to analyze when you actually bring into the frequency domain look at the diagram you can clearly see the different spectral components at different frequency and that is always the advantage of frequency domain analysis so there therefore it is also known as spectral analysis why spectral analysis because number of spectral components can be seen at different frequencies in discrete level so therefore it is most powerful and standard method of eeg signal analysis it also provides information in the frequency domain by adopting statistical and fourier transform there are number of statistical transforms and fourier transforms which are used and power spectral analysis is commonly used where the power spectrum provides the data related to frequency content of the signal or distribution of signal power over the frequency so normalized amplitude can be seen what component has is having what normalized uh, value we can also determine the power spectral density the power per unit uh, frequency uh, the power spectrum can be uh, you know plotted very easily when we do the frequency domain analysis so what is the use of the signal processing the thing is that when you do the same analysis for a normal person and when you repeat the analysis for abnormal person or uh, say for example it is not always used for uh, the the, uh, the the subjects who are suffering with some disease say we are currently working on the the subjects who are doing meditation and who are not doing meditation so the subjects who are doing meditation and again uh, the subjects are doing meditation for how many years so depending on all these three major categories we can clearly see the difference in their frequency spectrum so it means that at certain frequencies you will find the difference in terms of the signal and time domain analysis is nothing but the direct time domain signal and time domain analysis of course uh, you know is also used where you can directly compute a number of things uh, there are methods for time domain analysis called as linear prediction component analysis these are the uh, like linear prediction gives estimated value equal to linear combination of all past values with the present and past input value similarly the component analysis is kind of unsupervised method uh, we will talk about what is supervised and what is unsupervised when it, when we go to ml model in which the data set is mapped to the <laughs> feature set the time domain method interfaces between physical time interpretation and conventional spectral analysis so it definitely takes towards spectral analysis and time frequency analysis 
can you tell me any example of time frequency analysis? Let us pause for 20 seconds. Yeah, can you give any example of time frequency analysis tool? I believe you are, uh, some of you are master and doctoral level students. Yeah, I'm pausing for uh, doing a pause for 20 seconds. Can you tell me any uh, tool uh, that is used for time frequency analysis? Okay, all right. Uh, the very popular time frequency analysis tool is Wavelet. You must have heard about Wavelet Transform. The Wavelet Transform, it always provides time frequency analysis, and that is used to extract and represent properties from transient biological signals. The signals, biological signals, which are you know varying with the time. So look at the 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 change in terms of frequency. Look at the uh, the plot, which is the plot between frequency and time. You know, there are different components and their variations. And when we actually use some wavelet features, wavelet tool in our cognitive task, like I have uh, explained that we have some three papers in IEEE sensor journals. In one of my lecture, I have uh, decided that we will discuss on any of the paper that how we have used this uh, signal processing to make you understand that these tools are practically very useful in the analysis of uh, the brain signals. So through wavelet decomposition, a number of transient features can be captured and localized in both time as well as frequency domain. The transform is like a mathematical microscope. The wavelet transform is just like a mathematical microscope and can analyze different scales of neural rhythms and can also investigate small scale oscillations of brain signal. So neural rhythms probably, you know, using frequency and uh, sorry, uh, using time domain and small scale oscillations probably by frequency domain. So both can be seen at the same time using time frequency analysis. And in addition to Wavelet transform, there is one more transform called as Hilbert Huang transform. It is also used to decompose EEG signals into a number of oscillatory components, small oscillatory components uh, called as intrinsic model functions. And uh, we can capture the instantaneous frequency data of the brain signal. And on the basis of intrinsic mode functions and analyzing the oscillatory components, we can analyze the signal and compare with the other uh, subjects. So until we take one signal in detail, and apply the Fourier transform or wavelet transform is very difficult to understand what the, what is the change which happens. And I can understand that uh, you also would definitely like to see that kind of processing. And uh, we will have uh, such examples in lecture to come. So ANN model, like I was telling you, some ML method can also be used for either classification even uh, the it can be involved in the pre-processing or uh, using uh, uh, can be used for some uh, feature extraction. For example, recurrent neural network. CNN method becomes a very popular method, uh, which is uh, used as a deep learning model. Uh, the big EEG data where huge amount of information is there, like ANN, which is used uh, uh, that addresses the high computational it, it, it actually, it, it requires high computational resource for real time processing. Cloud based deep learning models are also there, which are uh, used for the real time analysis of big EEG data. So let's uh, talk about signal characteristics. BCI is used to detect and quantify characteristics of BCI signals. Uh, from the signals, we identify some characteristics and those characteristics are actually translated into device commands and to provide concurrent feedback. So either we generate some commands or we also generate some feedback signal. So how do we get these two? It is by translating some characteristics. So what are those characteristics and how do we quantify and detect the characteristics? Let's understand characteristics also include signal features. So characterizing means we will characterize this signal with the help of suitable features, like feature extraction is therefore important. 
so that we can obtain characteristics from the information and that can repre represent some meaningful form of uh, for either human interpretation or computer interpretation. This gives one uh, comparison in terms of uh, uh, the different characteristics like uh, a characteristic or uh, some parameters like signals uh, you can see here under invasive there are two intracortical and uh, ECOG we have talked about non-invasive there are EEG, FNRIS, FMRI, EOG and then MEG. EOG uh, I'm not able to recall the name we will we'll probably see this. So risk is you see here in invasive it is always high. Spatial resolution is very high in intracortical. Why it is high? You can understand when you are putting something inside the brain. So the resolution will be definitely high. And in case of non-invasive, it's all either low, medium and uh, high in uh, functional MRI. Otherwise, uh, uh, it's almost low or medium because uh, these modalities uh, are captured. Uh, unlike uh, the, these modalities where we either insert some markers or put some uh, integrated circuit. Temporal resolution, I think we have had a discussion. Invasive, it's very high and here it is. Signal to noise ratio is another parameter. Signal to noise ratio, probably you all understand that tells the quality of signal with respect to noise, unwanted effect. So SNR is generally expressed. This is a very uh, popular term used in uh, signal processing, communication, data processing, and so on, data communication. It is always expressed generally in dB, decibel, and it is very high in invasive, obviously, because in invasive you are reaching inside, so signal strength, the quality in terms of noise will be more, but in case of other inv non-invasive models, cable is there, so many other uh, interfering uh, things are there, sources of artifacts are there, that will degrade the quality of SNR. Portability is uh, very high non-invasive, in case of invasive, it is not. Like cost is therefore very high in case of invasive. In non-invasive also, in case of functional MRI and MEG, the cost is high. The what is the characteristic in uh, different modalities? Like intracortical and eco -AG, the characteristic is electrical signal. EEG, as the name suggests, electroencephalograph, the characteristic is electrical, means signal is, the nature of signal is electrical. Uh, a time domain, a time series signal. It is not 2D signal, it is a time series signal. With time, we see the, the variation in the potential, is small voltages, and then we uh, try to extract the different waveforms and like that. Like functional NIRS, optical, because the term itself has a spectroscopy, so we get the optical signal. Functional MRI has metabolic, MEG is magnetic, and E here probably is also electrical. I need to check. And here the characteristic is also electrical. So this gives a comparison of the different uh, signals and the modalities. Like I was talking about features. This is just an example. It's just an example. There may be hundreds of different features like time domain, uh, time frequency domain features, and at the bottom, nonlinear dynamic system features. Like under time uh, frequency domain features, you can see peak to peak mean value, mean square value, variance, variance and mean square value are very, very popular. And then uh, there is a Zorth parameter activity, Zorth parameter mobility. So activity is there, mobility is there, complexity there, maximum power spectral frequency, maximum power spectral density, then average power. So these are the different features and there may be many, many other uh, features which are like in time frequency domain, wavelet features are also there. Wavelet coefficients are there. What type of wavelet? There are different types of wavelet uh, series, wavelet families, and under each family, what kind of coefficient, statistical wavelet, what kind of wavelet. So there are different types of features which are extracted uh, by using some signal processing. So when we say wavelet feature, obviously wavelet transform will be computed and we'll be able to compute the wavelet coefficients. Nonlinear dynamics like approximate entropy, complexity, correlation, 
ियल so snr i was talking about snr is the ratio of signal power to the noise ratio generally we compute like this signal power divided by noise power high snr indicates minimum uh, noise signal uh, by the background noise or any artifact so lesser is the noise better will be the snr snr is generally expressed in uh, you know uh, db you can see i i, I hope every one of you knows about this when the signal is in terms of power we use tan log to the base tan when the signal is expressed in terms of either current or voltage we we it here it comes 20 i hope everyone uh, knows this reason yeah can anyone simplify it both the noise and artifacts uh, 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 can contaminate the signal can produce unwanted effect in the signal let us understand what is the difference between noise and artifact so let's understand artifact both are unwanted artifacts can be due to biological external sources such as eye blinks artificial respiratory activities and so on noise is uh, you know of course contributed by some external source uh, you know the internal uh, circuitry or internal factors are not responsible maybe if you are recording meg for example magnetoencephalograph and nearby there is a magnetic field or magnetic effect so that will produce distortion in your original signal so that kind of signal is your noise for example you all understand taking one example in communication system you are standing between a crowd in inside a crowd and you are receiving or transmitting your call you are talking to your friend so the persons who are speaking who are talking around you that creates you know that contaminates your signal quality so that is actually noise but there may be some internal difficulty related to amplifier related to the sensor related to handset related to your phone device those are all uh, you know a distortion so here we don't use distortion we call it as artifact both contaminate the signal and uh, i'm sorry i was trying to ask you one question just to have pause otherwise i'm just going one way so one way is actually not good so i uh, i was asking you a question that uh, in case of power when there is a power term uh, we are taking 10 log to the base tan when there is a current it comes 20 log why can anyone answer please can anyone answer please anyone can volunteer come on you may you know you may say that professor this is not a question valid question see when the signal is in terms of current or voltage you know that current or voltage is proportional to rather power is proportional to voltage square or current square so when you convert power in terms of voltage and current to the power 2 will come here and you know in logarithm that 2 goes here and it becomes 20 i just answered because i asked you this question so i thought you would be answering so that there would be some pause okay so feature vector i hope uh, you are aware about the feature vector i again give you the platform uh, 10 second can anyone define feature vector has every has anyone heard about feature vector okay hopefully during the break uh, you are uh, going to interact with me all right that time we'll interact so feature vector as as its name suggests vector you know consist of you know set of variables so when you have number of features they are arranged in in terms of some set of variables or uh, uh, you know uh, uh, vector of features so fundamental feature uh, there may be many fundamental features that we extract a fundamental feature which we get using direct measurement that is nothing but voltage difference between pair of two electrode why two electrodes are there we will discuss in the design and definitely in the next lecture the next lecture is on 
design and implementation of BCI. So this provides limited relevant information about the complex brain. Remember, brain is very complex and we are getting limited relevant information. So we need so many features. One feature is not enough. Therefore, it becomes to use huge amount of features, huge number of features. They may be linear, non-linear. They may be ratio of one feature to other. That may be statistical measures, statistical metrics, statistical features, other transformations of multiple fundamental features which are detected at multiple electrodes or at multiple time points at several times, you know, repeated intervals using repeated uh, electrodes, same electrode, different electrodes. We can get so much of information and that is a set of features called as feature vector. Most features used in BCI are based on either uh, spatial, temporal or spectral analysis. Spatial you understand, temporal you also understand, spectral now you also understand. The spectral gives you the frequency content, frequency information of brain signals or interrelationship. The, the features may keep the information related to either spatial and temporal or relationship between temporal and spectral or any other combination. So the set of features is known as feature vector. So when you uh, when you send your feature to a neural network or ML model machine learning, so you don't send single feature. You send set of features, you know, feature vectors for the training to the uh, machine uh, learning. I hope uh, how does machine learning work? These days everyone is aware of, you know, it just gets the data and then it trains the data. Understanding the data, interpretation of data is only possible when you train. So just remember about yourself in a childhood, you know, you learned something, you trained yourself. How did you train yourself? By using suitable learning method or turning met uh, training method. In the similar manner, the computer also does, the machine also does. And there are some mathematicals, there are some matrices, differential calculations, and so many other methods are there, which are the foundation of uh, the learning of machine. So this diagram, you know, is a very uh, a pictorial representation of uh, what we call as a feature vector and uh, complete uh, description. I'm sorry. So you look at here pre-processed data. The top one, if you look at the the data is pre-processed, which we are uh, obtaining from certain electrodes. There are number of electrodes. Uh, you know, this side is your nasal area. This side is just opposite area and this uh, where is A1 and A2, probably this side, they are the ear areas, right? And accordingly, these are the different node positions and you get the pre-processed data like this and you apply a number of operations and you get different types of waves, different types of features. So you look, look at, there are feature sets like IMF1, IMF2, and each feature set consists of number of features related to energy, fractal dimension, and other things. So this is something related to feature vector that goes for a further analysis. So we will uh, discuss about this uh, a diagram and then uh, we will uh, have a break today for 10 minutes. So this diagram actually, you know, uh, depicts the complete BCI signal process. Look at here. Uh, in fact, uh, you can see there are three different lines. We will we will explain it, but here also you can understand very well. All these three different lines are actually bringing information from different electrodes. So in terms of BCI, we call them different channel. So actually this is one channel from where one signal, you look at the time domain signal, time series signal. From other channel, there is one more signal coming and there are different channels from where different signals are coming. And when uh, the signals are acquired, you look at here, they are passed through some amplifiers. Sometimes we call it as uh, bio signal amplifier or normal amplifiers, and then they are sent to analog to digital converters because we don't process these days anything on analog. We use always DSP, digital signal processing. So we need to convert analog signal into digital signal. So we have uh, 
analog to digital converter. So before that, we amplify, we pass through a specific type of bio amplifiers, bio signal amplifiers. Why amplifiers are needed? I, I hope you can understand very easily. The signal strength is very weak, which we acquire from the brain because the scalp is a uh, outer surface and inside there are neuronal activities which we are recording. So the signal strength which comes out of the brain and recorded by the electrodes which are which are not providing the direct interface, there is some gel conduct conducive uh, gel which is providing the interface. So signal strength is uh, weak and therefore it is amplified and then we pass through analog to digital converter. Hopefully in next slides I will explain you uh, what is this, uh, how does it work? We use, uh, you know, sampling, quantization, encoding. Whenever we talk about analog to digital converter, there are always three important stages called as uh, sampling, quantization, and encoding. So after that, we get the signals purely in the form of discrete or digitized pulses, and they are sent for signal conditioning circuits. That may be some uh, filtering circuits and other circuits. And then we can, uh, you know, uh, either uh, do uh, some other, other kind of operation. There may be some similarity that can be reduced. Uh, there may be some uh, data duplication that could be avoided. So in order to do that, we apply again some uh, blocks. And then finally, we use certain algorithm, mathematical models, to extract or signal processing to extract the features and then we create the feature vectors and those feature vectors are finally translated by using some ML model or a classifier uh, in terms of device commands and those device commands are sent through the application device and it goes to goes as a user interface uh, a signal. So this is how the brain uh, BCI signal processing works. So the signal which is indicated here may be any type of signal, uh, either EEG, MEG or whatever, whatever type of signal. But if the signal changes, the type of signal changes, the, the use of uh, appropriate filters and the different methods of feature extraction might definitely change based on what kind of uh, uh, the, the signal, what kind of modality is uh, uh, being used. So this diagram is uh, highlighting what I was telling is uh, you all understand very well that how do we convert analog signal into digital. This is just an example where you are getting a signal in terms of EEG we get a signal in terms of either uh, millivolt or microvolt and then uh, we can use amplifiers because millivolt and microvolt the signal strength is very less then uh, passing through sampler, quantizer, and encoder, then probably you know the output won't be properly visible and it would be difficult to encode. So we amplify using a biosignal amplifier to higher voltages, and then we use analog to digital, digital converter. Sometimes amplifiers are combined with ADC, or sometimes we can separately use the analog to digital converter. So ADC comprises of mainly sampling and the quantization. This is in fact uh, the other aspect of our, uh, uh, you know, electronic circuitry. So I, I believe those who have uh, electronic background, not even electronics background, those who have some digital design background, they all understand this diagram analog signal. It goes to sampling. Sampler is a train of impulses. Mathematically, you can write as a train of impulses. Sometimes uh, today I am not I have not connected my iPad. Otherwise, I would have written. Generally, we write like this: del t minus, you know, k t, like this, k t s. This one. This is your sampling function. I'm writing with the cursor so probably therefore you know the handwriting is not good so this is how some sampling works so how does your uh, sampling function look like it looks like this you know kind of uh, train up impulses obviously 
all these uh, the magnitude are all same and at certain interval say this is first one is ts second one is 2ts and so on so this sampling function is applied and then it uh, uh, it converts your signal into discrete time signal so there are different types of sampling natural flat top we are not going to the detail so you look at here it is following the envelope and then we provide some kind of method called as approximation and convert it into some suitable steps by uh, uh, dividing by quantization levels. We can increase the sampling rate and increase the number of quantization levels where we calculate the step size by, you know, the total uh, swing in the analog VH minus VL divided by 2 to the power N. And this 2 to the power N is important thing called as quantization levels, where N is the number of digits. Digits means how many digits every pulse will be, how many bits each pulse will be encoded. So you all probably would be aware of this process called as uh, quantization and, uh, and then encoding. Sometimes we also call it as a PCM, pulse code modulation, because every uh, pulse, according to their width, according to their amplitude, will be encoded differently into different stream of bits. So we call it as pulse code modulation, where the change in the uh, stream of bit depends on the equivalent uh, pulse, uh, you know, uh, code. So every pulse code is different. Uh, that is what is the pulse code modulation. So I think, uh, yeah, we still have five more minutes. No problem. We can uh, close here. So you see here, this is uh, exactly how the blue colored signal is the actual signal and the staircase signal is the signal by which is obtained by the quantization. Quantization is a process where you divide the entire range into number of steps. Each step is called as a one step quantization level. And then what do we do that entire range is assigned some uh, binary values. We can do from either bottom to top or top on top to bottom. Both are valid. So look at a corresponding value, say this particular pulse here. So that will be corresponding to rather than sending certain voltage, this particular pulse will be 100. This will be 101. Then say top one, 111. So a stream of bits, say the last one, this one, 000. The next one is 001, 010, and the next one is 011. So rather than transmitting this analog signal, we transmit the stream of bits. And this is how we convert by using uh, sampling quantization. Yeah, I have included this because this is an important process which is required in the uh, signal processing used for BCI. Otherwise, I hope all of you must have, under, must have studied this at elementary level that when you talk about signal, how, what are different types of signal, continuous signal, analog signal, then we convert into discrete signal, discontinuous signal, because we all, you know, are in today, digital world. We are living in digital world. Almost everything is digital. We feel digital. So how digital happens, how does it, uh, you know, become digital is very important to understand. The process behind is sampling, quantization, and encoding. And then, uh, because as I mentioned that, all Continuous signals are all natural signals are continuous or analog. So again, you want to understand you need to use a device called as digital to analog converter. So probably uh, I, I think hopefully we can uh, uh, we have covered the some basics about the different modalities which we acquire from brain signal and then how uh, what type of uh, information is content in each modality, uh, whether uh, a particular modality represents chemical activity or electrical activity, and how those modalities are captured, how those modalities are different, and from those modalities, what kind of features we extract, and what do we do with those features? We have, uh, you know, uh, discussed all these things uh, in this particular part of uh, signal processing for BCI. In we were talking about capturing the signal and then getting the raw signal and then amplifying it. After amplifying, we can 
you know you can in, even say that uh, amplification is a part of uh, pre processing what is pre processing is when you are using a signal for certain analysis maybe to generate some commands uh, with the help of bci or generate some feedback signal that's the application so what is pre processing amplifier is of course playing uh, a pre processing stage playing as a pre processing stage to strengthen the the signal strength so this is one example where you can understand how does uh, sampling work uh, you know that uh, <coughs> rather than continuous signal the signal has been converted in the form of discrete pulses so i was telling about uh, the sampling the sampler is nothing but the train of impulses and then you integrate that train of impulses with this continuous signal uh, you can uh, understand that this continuous signal look like uh, looks like a pattern one of the patterns of uh, eeg signal so what is important is the process of capturing the signal at a specific instance in the time so we have a specific instance so that specific instant is generally called as sampling interval and how do you get sampling interval uh, that uh, you know you all know that uh, sampling frequency fs uh, you know that becomes 1 divided by sampling interval so your sampling time say it is 10 millisecond or 1 millisecond if it is 1 millisecond so your sampling frequency will be 1 uh, kilohertz so in that case your fs will be 1 kilohertz so you get uh, one sampler as a train of impulses and uh, then a specific instance in time you know uh, you get the signal using sampling so signal value uh, at the instances in the called as samples or the discrete pulses and the spacing is sampling rate or sampling time or uh, the sampling frequency so that uh, is uh, uh, about the sampling higher the sampling rate better is the time resolution and more accurately the sampling signal represents the original signal so when we actually go into the details of sampling rate so remember one thing so this is a very important thing in uh, uh, the eeg signal acquisition we have to always keep sampling rate very high sampling rate has to be very high so that the reconstruction when we reconstruct the signal because whenever in the signal analysis you know uh, though here we want to you know, generate some suitable command or feedback signal so if we are generating the feedback signal or we are generating the command command will be you know will be definitely the continuous command continuous signal the feedback signal will be the continuous signal so when we are interested to reconstruct the signal from digital to analog back the sampling frequency plays significant role more is the sampling frequency better is the reconstruction output i hope uh, you you are aware about this very important uh, you know name called as nyquist theorem or nyquist rate uh, you know this rate says that uh, the nyquist theorem says that the sampling rate must be greater than must be greater than or equal to double of sampling frequency so you see here there are three situations which are uh, included look at here the first one where sampling frequency is greater than twice of maximum frequency of the message message means in the context of ecg signal the original signal frequency is and that too we take the maximum frequency wherever the maximum frequency occurring is there because uh, <clears throat> one signal uh, which is generated as a delta or alpha or beta uh, does not necessarily to have uh, same frequency the the variation may be there so whatever is the maximum component uh, there may be harmonics present in the signal so whatever is the maximum signal the double of that so sampling rate must be in fact greater than or equal to this one this is called as nyquist uh, theorem what is nyquist rate exactly if it is equal to twice of uh, you know uh, signal maximum signal frequency it is called as perfect sampling 
and when it is less there is a problem if the sampling rate of particular is less than nyquist sampling rate the distortion occurs due to poor sampling rate and it is called as aliasing so this aliasing is a you know difficult thing that creates unwanted effect in the signal uh, in fact you can clearly see here and uh, that there is overlapping between the two component look at the first component this one and second component is this one and third component is this one so there is clearly overlapping and the overlapping always causes you know distortion in the system it will always cause some distortion so unwanted effect will be always there in the signal analysis so <clears throat> lower sampling frequency or sampling rate is not allowed uh, it must be either twice or maximum but must not be very high uh, we will discuss about this because uh, this is an important factor in uh, signal processing uh, when it comes to any signal processing be it uh, biomedical signal processing eeg signal processing or anything uh, when it is exactly equal to 2 fm what is the problem can anyone respond when exactly is equal to 2 to 2 fm what will be the problem now by the way you might be wondering that uh, how did we get this signal these are nothing but you look at here y omega so your signal is represented in frequency domain uh, when you convert your uh, time domain signal into frequency domain i hope you know it uh, you know when you calculate uh, uh, that uh, next time what i will do i will try to connect with my tab and uh, so that i can write uh, with my pencil i'll try to do that so when you calculate fourier transform of ft it becomes f omega right and this is actually your fourier transform so signal is converted in frequency domain signal is converted in frequency domain now the question arises when i'm saying it is exactly equal to 2 fm what is the problem and why do we want less uh, little more than 2 fm this is also all right if we have exactly equal to 2 fm there is no problem at all but what is the problem that if there is any variation in signal frequency so there may be overlap there might be overlap and we know that it is very difficult to generate precise value of frequency so whenever there is any change in the frequency of signal there might be overlap that will again cause the distortion those who are communication students they understand in telephonic communication poor sampling rate causes you know cross talk when you are calling some other person but other third person is connected over your call that is in communication called as cross talk because in communication also signal is a very important thing where we use the sampling because we sample the signal convert into digital and then communicate and the third one whenever you have greater than so there will be always a spacing between the two component look at here there is a spacing between the two component so in terms of communication this is called as guard band why there is a spacing why there is a guard band because there will be no possibility of overlapping so therefore this is allowed but why overlapping over sampling it is writing if it is very really much larger slightly larger than 2 fm is okay but if it is much larger than 2 fm sampling rate will be very high and hope you can understand sampling rate is very high means what you know uh, if you could if you could see the see the uh, quantization levels the number of quantization levels will be more number of bits will be more so in order to represent a single pulse single uh, uh, you know sample you need more number of bits i think uh, this is very simple uh, when you increase the num uh, more and more sampling rate the number of bits to represent each sample will be more remember the reconstruction the quality of reconstructed output will be definitely very good but the minimum is just twice of maximum signal frequency or slightly above but if you increase so much uh, you know too much uh, the sampling rate then uh, the increased bandwidth will be required because per sample will require more number of bits so this is how more amount of bits so in terms of digital communication and transmission we call it bandwidth 
So bandwidth requirement will become more uh, in terms of uh, the 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 number of bits for that particular channel. All right. So uh, what do we do that when there is a poor sampling? If there is a poor sampling, then uh, aliasing effect comes. In order to deal with aliasing effect, we use anti-aliasing filter. Anti-aliasing filter and uh, analog signals are passed through some low pass filters before sampling, also known as anti-aliasing filters. And uh, in a scalp recorded EEG, like uh, which we can observe the activity, uh, say that occurs above 80 hertz, for example. So what we can do, anti-aliasing filter, 80 hertz could be applied in sampling rate of 160 hertz would be sufficient. The meaning is, say the EEG signal is, the frequency is 80 hertz, which is very high. This much we don't get, rather I would say 8 hertz. So if 8 hertz is a frequency, we have to use sampling rate at least 16 hertz. If it is less, it may produce some aliasing. We can pass through some anti-aliasing filter and then we can digitize so that proper reconstruction will happen. So the sampling rate above is acceptable, but it is unnecessary. I was talking about this one because unnecessarily more sampling rate would require more data storage space. So I was telling you that uh, more number of bits will be involved in such case. So Fourier analysis, what does it do? What do we do? Like, uh, you know, in Fourier analysis, we are talking about signal processing. And remember, in signal processing, the transform domain uh, analysis is very popular. Transform domain means the signal can be converted from time domain to any uh, transform. It, it, it is not necessarily to be a Fourier transform. Here, uh, the time domain signal is converted into Fourier transform. So the signal is becoming in frequency domain. So it time domain signal and its equivalent frequency domain representation, which actually is used to decompose the signal into indivisible components and can be isolated and evaluated independently. So look at uh, if you compare the time domain signal here, and if you compare with uh, the frequency domain, look at, you know, there are clearly, uh, you can clearly see the components at certain frequency. So the isolated components can then be evaluated independently, can be studied independently, and the signal analysis becomes much better uh, when you have uh, indivisible components. So this is the biggest advantage of working in the transform domain. There are many other transforms like, you know, Fourier transform, like in digital signal processing, discrete signal processing, we call uh, Z transform, Hilbert transform, Cosine transform, a very popularly used transform is a DCT. You know, we use a term called as DCT, especially when we work on images, right? When we work on images, we popularly use a discrete cosine transform. Uh, discrete cosine transform is used uh, to get the signal in terms of, uh, you know, different coefficients and then we can reduce some content. So this is also used for compressing the image and we can reduce the redundancy in the signal. So there are different transforms which are used for different purposes. Here the purpose is to better interpret, to better understand and to better uh, you know, analyze the signal. How does frequency transform? Uh, how do we get frequency transform? It's very simple mathematics. You know, you can just convert time domain into frequency domain by a simple formula minus infinite to infinite xt to the power minus j omega t dt. And then if you can decompose, it is possible in real and imaginary part, a omega plus j b omega, because when you solve it, definitely it will produce two different components, real part and imaginary part. So what is the thing which we can take from here is Fourier analysis or frequency domain analysis, which is very, very useful in the signal analysis of even the biomedical signal. The magnitude and phase of each sinusoidal component can be uh, estimated. When you discuss in electronic circuit or in analog electronic circuit, you study about frequency response, frequency response of a, uh, you know, a system, frequency response of a circuit, frequency response of a device. So what is the importance of frequency response? 
the frequency response indicates or tells us that at individual frequency, what is the value of gain? What is the value of magnitude? What is the value of phase? If there is any change in phase, if there is any deviation in the phase, all those we can clearly, you know, observe. I hope uh, what I'm saying, you are very easily understanding. If you have real and imaginary part in frequency domain, you can calculate its magnitude like this and the phase you can calculate what is called as the argument 10 inverse of imaginary part divided by real part. So at each angle, at each angle means at each frequency, you can find at each component, at each isolated uh, component, the different spectral components can be studied uh, having different magnitude and phase. The original time domain signal can be reconstructed. Now the, the coming back to the original signal, what we are doing is for the better analysis, but whenever we want the signal to be back, you know, in the original form that is possible just by computing uh, the inverse Fourier transform and uh, we can compute the inverse Fourier transform like this. Remember, this is ordinary Fourier transform. In uh, case of uh, uh, what we call as DSP, we don't uh, use the ordinary Fourier transform. We calculate the DFT, what we call as discrete Fourier transform or we calculate fast Fourier transform, FFT, FFT at different types of FFT, four level FFT, four point at FFT, eight point FFT, 16 point FFT, based on how much uh, is the data length, according to we calculate the Fourier transform for the discrete time signal. Why I'm talking about this? Because we have converted our signal into discrete and digital form, so we are not going to use the ordinary, you know, uh, the transform we are going to use this one but remember when we are interested in spectral analysis even if there is a discrete time signal you can calculate its Fourier transform so in the interesting thing here is remember uh, Fourier transform can be computed for discrete signal discrete signal I am saying here for the signal which has been converted from continuous domain to discrete domain so uh, Fourier transform can be computed in two different ways one uh, the input is discrete time signal. Your output can still be continuous signal where you can see the spectra. And uh, the DFT is something where your input is discrete and the DFT output is also discrete. So both are possible. And FFT is nothing but one type of DFT. It's not very different. Uh, let, let's say one example here, EEG in the time domain. What is EEG? That can be clearly seen here. So when you see the time domain signal, you know, very uh, small amount of electrical voltage and that varies with time and the variation is so close because based on the frequency. So it's very, very difficult to uh, understand and analyze the signal in time domain. And therefore we go for frequency domain. So in frequency domain, look at the plot, which is actually the Fourier transform of the signal. And uh, it, it gives better, uh, it gives very good clarity that at certain frequency, look at the uh, X axis, hertz means frequency and Y axis, it is a uh, uh, microvolt per hertz, means this is called as uh, your amplitude spectrum. You can also uh, plot frequency spectrum, uh, power spectrum, where you can calculate the power uh, per unit frequency, that is volt square per unit hertz. In that case, this becomes power spectral density plot, PSD plot. But here it's amplitude spectrum plot, amplitude versus frequency. The, the, the benefit of this is easier way of uh, doing the analysis. Going to the third one, as I was telling you, it gives both uh, the frequency as well as time distribution. With time, how the signal changes and how much variation comes in terms of frequency. So uh, Y axis uh, and X axis, uh, they are including both time and frequency domain uh, values, but it's a uh, little different than what is there in uh, the second part of the picture. So when we'll discuss some kind of wavelet for biomedical signal processing, I will explain you what is the use of uh, this type of time frequency domain analysis of the signal. So when we have both uh, the best example of the signal analysis done by is uh, wavelet transform. So then uh, now we uh, have uh, extracted the features 
we have applied certain signal processing, extracted the features. We have uh, sets of features called as feature vectors. What is the ultimate aim is to translate the features because the features are for machine. Features are for the computer or the device. Uh, and then uh, what we need is uh, to generate some commands or to generate some feedback signal. Depending on commands for uh, controlling some devices, appliances, robots, robotic arms, wheelchairs, and so on, and uh, or uh, generating some feedback signal to address some disability and disorder problem or some rehabilitation problem in the human brain. So you look at the diagram very carefully that uh, motor imagery. Motor imagery means uh, when we are moving, uh, doing some movement tasks, motor. As I told you that uh, in the brain, there are three major uh, activities which are uh, uh, detected, motory, sensory and cognitive. So motor imagery and then it definitely affects your uh, signal in some part of the brain uh, wherever uh, movement motor motory cortex is the there in motory cortex that uh, signal can be recorded in the form of EEG signal and then then it goes to signal processing. Look at this diagram. This is a signal processor. Of course, in the form of IC, you can say DSP. It's a DSP digital signal processor that combines or that has a number of components like uh, it is used to decode the signal. It is used to extract the features. It is used to understand the features and then it is used to classify. So this DSP has uh, a preprocessor, a signal processor, feature extractor, feature classifier, and then uh, ML and AI model for training and understanding that feature set. Then it generates control signals or some generate feedback signal like this kind of operations, robot wheelchair, robotic arm, haptic arm, all those things can be generated, can be controlled rather by the control signals generated by the uh, this particular device. And uh, then uh, you can have uh, this thing also. So the, the natural communication channel uh, broken where uh, say if uh, the person is having some difficulty in walking, if the person is having some difficulty in the movement in that case, this may probably also, uh, you know, in that case what it will do that it will try to generate uh, some feedback signal and then it will be subjected here. And accordingly, uh, this particular area, you know, it uh, some correction will be uh, applied there and uh, we can try to restore the ability which is lost. So probably if you can recall uh, in uh, our last lecture, we were talking about replacement, enhancement, restoration, uh, you know, regaining, etc. So this is also possible. That part is uh, not included here. So the features uh, which we extract must be translated and of course uh, how can we translate? We can translate using suitable translation algorithm. What is algorithm? Algorithm is nothing but computer algorithm is what? Computer method. What is computer method? There is always some mathematics. So we have some mathematical model and that method mathematical model is implemented in computer. We call it as a algorithm. Programming is a tool or a way by which we write the mathematics. So programming is not a method. Programming is, you know, the tool by which we implement the method or the algorithm. So the algorithm uh, may deploy some model, appropriate model that can be a mathematical procedure or having a lot of mathematical equations, set of equations or a mapping functions and so on in order to translate the features into suitable commands. So I, I believe uh, if you have read some uh, uh, journal articles or conference papers you might have seen, especially when you look at some IEEE transaction papers, you will find that in your papers full of mathematics will be there. So it explains everything in terms of mathematics, every step, the method, the different stages of methods, sub, sub stages of the methods, the algorithm, the flow diagram, for everything, especially in IEEE transaction, you will find that 
there are a lot of mathematics involved. So all those mathematics actually represent some, you know, part or sub part of algorithm, how the algorithm operates in the methodology to get uh, the work done to meet the objective. So this accepts the feature vector. So the translation algorithm will receive the feature vector as a input at a given time instant and its input and processes the feature vector to the output uh, set of commands that application device can recognize. So these devices like robotic or wheelchair, the commands, those those commands which can be recognized by these wheelchair or the applications, uh, that kind of commands can be generated like this. So the model, how does model work? The goal, the aim is to describe a relationship between features and the user's intent. User's intent means what does user want? What is the application of the command? So according to that command, there must be mapping between the features, the relationship between features and the users. What is the requirement of user? For example, uh, say there are two variables and uh, there is a simple relationship, a linear relationship, say, y is equal to bx plus a, where uh, uh, b is the slope of the function, a is the intercept, you all understand, and uh, y is the this one. I hope you all know that when you plot a curve like this, this particular value is a, this is your y, and this is x. So you can write a mathematical function like this, y is equal to bx plus c. So this equation is used as a model. I mean, simple linear equation. Let's take this as a mathematical model. Say X is a feature vector as an input vector. Y is also a vector because there will be then, then only there will be mapping between vector and vector. So Y is a vector of commands sent to the output device. The value of B and A are nothing but parameters. So these parameters, you can also say either uh, the parameters of algorithm, training parameters, you know, the model parameters, modeling parameters. So depending on these parameters, uh, the, the vector commands can be always uh, changed. That these parameters also changing the impacting the, uh, the commands which are uh, generated. So given a new observation, uh, say EEG factor model provides a prediction. So based on uh, whatever uh, feature vector we are getting from EEG data, the commands will be predicted by the variable y. Uh, probably that can be used for, you know, three dimensional robotic arm movement uh, that has been uh, desired by the user. So whatever is the user's intent, user wants to control a robotic arm. So accordingly, some commands could be, you know, produced uh, and by the model, by the algorithm, a translation algorithm that will be operating over the EEG feature vectors. Feature vector uh, can have independent variables. Dependent variables are the commands because the commands are the final outputs and therefore they are dependent variables. And feature vectors are actually independent variables. They are the unique uh, attributes of, uh, you know, the, the signal which has been uh, acquired. So therefore they are not dependent. There might be some interrelationship uh, between the uh, features, but uh, they are basically independent variables. But the features which have been converted into commands by translation algorithm, generally they are the dependent variables that depend on the feature set. So the models which we use for different uh, translation tasks generally include undefined constants like A and B here, which act on features such as scaling factor. Here you look at here Bx. So B is obviously a scaling factor here. Uh, summation, some parameter can be used for summation, some can be used for subtraction, and data window length, bounds, the constants are called as model parameters. So there may be many parameters. Uh, the equation is a very simple linear equation. This may be also a nonlinear equation, y is equal to bx square plus ax plus c. So there may be nonlinear model, there may be linear model, and depending on that, uh, features will be translated into commands. This is a general picture. You understand that when we talk about ML coming into the picture to convert the uh, feature set into uh, different, uh, uh, you know, the commands, then ML can also be used uh, where uh, the models do not depend on feature extraction and translation separately. So in many cases, these days, both can be done by a single model 
like uh, supervised learning where the parameters can be trained, can be repeatedly adjusted until the model translates the feature vectors into the commands. So it's a supervised learning model. Uh, the, the ML model is uh, divided into two main categories. I hope uh, you all are aware, very well aware about ML, supervised learning, unsupervised learning. So the learning is an important thing. Supervised where you will have, uh, you know, uh, something called as uh, what I can say, uh, predefined output and predefined input. So you know that this is the set of input given to you and you also know where to reach. So you can change the parameters, you know, repeatedly so that you can reach to the outcome. Whereas in unsupervised, the input is always given, but output is unknown. So best example of unsupervised learning is clustering. So when you discuss about clustering, K means clustering, you know, fuzzy clustering means there are many popular methods where you rearrange, you combine, you manipulate the groups of all those uh, inputs which are given in such a way that you reach to the approximately, you know, desired output. So you always compute some uh, error function wherever you find that uh, convergence is happening. How the convergence will happen wherever the error is coming less and there your clustering will stop. The supervised learning, I'm not uh, interested to spend much time on this, but since this is also a model used for a translation, I'm just giving you the introduction. Obviously, when uh, uh, we I'll bring some results that time, you will get some example under uh, both of these categories. So supervised learning is of uh, two types. One is a classification, second is a regression. Classification always classifies, you know, the outputs in discrete fixed number of uh, classified outputs you will get. But in regression, what happens that you will get your output in, uh, you know, continuous span. Uh, it's not discrete. So you will get the, your classifications. Uh, each classification will cover certain range of uh, the values. So that is the difference between classification and regression. But in both this, you categorize the input uh, using supervised model and here you don't categorize rather you go on keep on clustering keep on grouping again and again until you your clustering uh, is no longer happening that is also uh, you know one definition where there is no more grouping possible and you reach to certain optimal so this is how those categorized or clustered final data you know they are again utilized uh, and interpreted uh, you know, for generating the suitable commands in the BCI application. The accuracy of the model, whichever model we use, is depends on objective function. I was telling you minimum error rate or objective function or cost function or fitness function. These are uh, the metrics which are evaluated whether uh, the model is accurate or not. The common objective function is a mean squared error, M-E-M-S-E between the model output and the correct output, the correct output and what is the output being generated by the model. The smaller the error, the accurate, more accurate is the model. So mean square error is one of the example. Minimum is the value, better is the, uh, the closeness is the output to the actual output. So supervised learning process, feature vectors can be processed by the model with some initial parameters because you have to apply some suitable parameters. As I told you in supervised learning, what do we do? The parameters will keep on adjusting, uh, keep on modifying, keep on changing. So you can begin with some initial parameters, uh, initial values of parameters, and then objective function will keep on comparing the model output with the correct output. This is what is called as training level. And then model parameters are adjusted or updated or modified based on objective function. Whenever objective function value becomes uh, less than the uh, specified value or uh, you know certain uh, minimum value threshold value you will stop the uh, process and then uh, those parameters are final model parameters and your data is categorized so the process this is repeated until some criteria is satisfied for example mean square error is minimized so what are the applications of uh, all these signal processing we are talking about. So we are coming to the end. We have talked about signal processing. Uh, they are used for two purposes. You know, one is for clinical application. I think there is nothing in this slide. One is used for clinical, second is used for BCI. 
clinical it is widely used in brain disease diagnosis and assessment so the one major application of biomedical signal processing is uh, the study of detection and diagnosis of brain related disease and disabilities and their assessment how much it is working you know how much is the disability what is the stage of brain tumor cancer something like that and other area is pure bci completely BCI uh, because in clinical you can stop till the brain tumor is detected or some brain abnormality is detected. It can be subjected for a screening and then uh, uh, you know for the further treatment it can be recommended and you can stop. But in BCI it can be used to develop a simple binary response for the control of a device. Binary response means are different types of commands whether you know run move do not move which direction so direction will be there you know how much uh, will be the the quantum of movement everything will be there so we develop a binary or other kind of responses through which we can control a device so this is going to be purely bci like uh, so so when we acquire the data you know uh, using a uh, uh, using uh, some electrodes, we acquire the raw data. Uh, we are just summing up now. We use the instrumentation amplifier to amplify the signal. We pass through either high pass filter or low pass filter according to our requirement. Then we pass to notch filter. This is really very interesting. Why we pass to notch filter? When we are interested in actually very, very, you know, uh, specific component, notch filter is nothing but a band pass filter where the passband is very thin. Uh, if I can uh, plot uh, the diagram, so this is, you know, like this, like this. So you see here, the signal which is passed, the passband is this, and this side is your stop band. So a band uh, uh, of signal is passed, but this is very narrow. So whenever the, the passband is very narrow, we generally, uh, call this as a notch filter because we are interested in a specific component and then we want to use that component. So we pass through post amplifier. We can use other operations and then digital, uh, you know, uh, acquisition card and then we can either store or display for a particular applications. So the electrodes made of silver, the electrodes, this particular discussion on electrode we will do in detail in the design lecture, in the next lecture, active electrodes placed on a scalp using conducive gel or paste. The, there can be 32, 64, 128, 256 electrodes. More is the number of electrodes reaching in the data set. Because if you increase the more number of electrodes, more coverage will be there. You can acquire more amount of data. Of course, I have told you two things. If you have more number of electrodes, more number of channels are there huge amount of data will come. Most of the data might be redundant, might be uh, useless. So that would add, that would increase the dimension of your data. So dimensionality of data would increase. So therefore, the selection of channel, there are algorithms, optimization methods which are required. And once you choose the number of uh, uh, channels optimally, again from those channels, you get the number of features and at the feature selection level also, you need to apply the uh, you know, optimization. Then we use a differential amplifier. It is nothing but uh, we use a, a pair of electrode. Remember, for every channel, there will be pair of electrodes that I will be discussing more in uh, the design. So whenever we are capturing a signal from a channel, there will be one ground electrode and there will be two electrodes. One will be the test and other will be the, the other place. I'll, I'll discuss about the number of electrodes which form the channel minimum number of electrodes will be two for one channel so signal processing why signal processing is needed so that we we can extract the useful information uh, we are coming to the conclusion method is used to extract the meaningful information and what information is there so that we can do some analysis therefore we do the signal processing the first step is to select the signal and then uh, you know select the channel and then uh, we are either interested in time domain or transform domain, apply the suitable method. And uh, we can also 
distinguish between what is deterministic signal, what is non-deterministic signal, what is random signal, what is non-random signal. All these analyses can be made whether the process is stochastic process, random or non-deterministic process. All these we can you know easily do. And then signals can be continuous, discontinuous. You understand it very well. If signal is continuous, we can convert into discontinuous because when we are <laughs> interested to apply DFT kind of operation, we need. This is what's just one example for case of epileptic seizure. Epileptic seizure, which is extracted from the temporal lobe area of the subject. So this is how the during epileptic seizure, the EEG signal signal looks like. And if I ask you to work on this signal, it's very you know difficult to work. Uh, in the time domain, you know, no characteristic is very visible properly. How can you calculate mean value standard deviation? So therefore you do some analysis. So say we are interested in certain power frequency terms only, certain frequency terms only. So we can calculate this power spectral density and we can only observe certain uh, frequency components and then we can do the analysis and the PSD is power spectral density. So in, uh, by plotting PSD, we can plot during the seizure, what was the PSD before the seizure? What was the PSD after uh, the treatment? What is the PSD? And accordingly, you know, remedial things can be done. It can be also analyzed whether uh, the uh, the epileptic seizure or or any brain disorder or disability is at early stage or medium stage or it uh, you know very risky stage. That kind of analysis can be done. So PSD is one example, you know. I think this is what the last slide and uh, there may be parametric method. There may be non parametric methods and uh, which method is better. Uh, it depends on choice of the model, good estimation of its length and accurate estimation of the parameters, the parameters which are used. So what are the parameters? What is the choice of the parameter choice of the model that decides, you know, is, uh, the, the better accuracy of the analysis. So the modeling which is used for signal processing may imply spectrum analysis, signal prediction, system identification, signal detection, signal classification. All these are covered under signal processing. So I hope, I believe we have come to the end for today's lecture. Uh, this is, I think, automatic regressive model where the, the spectral features are used. Automatic regressive model, which is one of the model uh, which is being used in the classifier. So we have